Hi, everybody. We're going to have a short prayer for the K-State fans this morning. Sorry about that. Yeah, I know. And for you KU fans, a basketball is just around the corner. So it's good to be with you. Uh, well, I think of cool churches that I love to visit. This is one of them. You guys always do things well. I had an interesting conversation with a young lady after the first service. She just couldn't understand how God, a loving God, could, could put people in hell. You know, we could all go home right now. We just worship. What a great praise team, right? But you know what? Each of us in this room, let me be clear. You got, you got an appointment with your maker someday. And you're going to face him. And you're going to be held accountable. That's how much he loves us. He gave us free will. He gave us free choice. You can say, God, stick in your ear. I want no part of you. When I was 20... One years of age. Well, I was thrown out of college at nine. Well, let's go back to the beginning. I got, <laughs> I got thrown out of the fourth grade, okay, for sticking my hand down my pants and sticking my finger out my fly and wiggling at some girls. That is not a good thing to do. This is not an endorsement. I got thrown out of Cub Scouts. Oh, oh I shouldn't have said that, should I? Sorry. Um, I got thrown out of college. Uh, when I got thrown out of college, I became a janitor. Uh, smoked Salem cigarettes, had my belt on the side, was a little grease ball, had a chipped front tooth that had a cap over it, and then the, the, it wore a hole in it. So I had a, a hole right here, a dark spot right in my front tooth. I was a looker. <laughs> and yet God, I met God through my wife, who was a nurse's aide, I met her in the men's room of a hospital. Some of you know the story, okay? It was miraculous because I'd never met a chick like this in my life. First thing I ever said to her was like, uh, would you go to the World's Fair with me? Well, this was Tucson, Arizona. The World's Fair was in New York City. Anyway, long story short, uh, I fell in love with this chick, okay? And, and she, by her s silent... She didn't share the four spiritual laws with me. If she did, I would never have been here today. She just loved me as I was. Okay? You guys just had a teaching last week about God's grace. It comes out of John 8. I'm telling you, we worship a God of grace. But we worship a God who's going to hold us accountable. And don't, in, in today's, you know, environment, you know, love all, serve all, everybody, all roads lead to heaven. Wrong. I am the way, the truth, and life. And you've got to come through me. That's what Jesus says. Okay? Tomorrow morning, by the way, the seminar, we start at uh, 9.30 in the morning for women. There'll be a few men. They'll sneak in. That's fine. That's cool. Uh, tomorrow night, we're talking about making children mine without losing yours. I'll put some information in there on a book I did that just got a national award called Have a New Teenager by Friday. They get weird about 11, and the good news, and the good news is they grow up about 25. <laughs> and hopefully they'll find someone to marry. But you know, God, always, God always uses people, you know, to make a difference in our lives. So uh, your kids might be grown, but you're welcome tomorrow night. In fact, I'll be back here in Kansas City this spring uh, talking about uh, to YPO, Young President's Organization. I do a lot of business speaking. And uh, it's interesting, the principles I use come out of two basic books for the business community, the birth order book which talks about how different everybody is in a family, and also have a new kid by Friday. So anyway, anyway, our topic this morning is have a new you by Friday. Here's the question. How many of you would like to change something in your life? Put your hand up. Now take a look around. This is universal. I've asked this a thousand times. We all want to change some things in our life. You want to change things. I, mean, I can tell you how to And how long does it take to change things? You go and see the therapist. He's got the 60 easy payment plan. And in just four years of therapy, you should be okay. <laughs> I, I don't really believe that's true. I think, I think behavior can change almost instantly. It did for me that night in the church when the pastor was talking about those who knew who Jesus Christ was in his head. They didn't know who he was in his heart. So how long does it really take to change things? It doesn't take, change, take a long time to change a 17-year-old's behavior, especially if he's mouthy especially if he's the tight end on the football team and he's scurrying for the car keys. Dad, I got I to gotta go. I'm going to be late. Honey, you're not going to find the keys. What are you talking about? I got to be there. Coach gets mad. I won't start if I don't. You're not going. 
The car's not going anywhere, neither are you. I've already called coach. He wants an explanation, but I thought you'd be best to give it to him. Because I didn't like your mouth this morning. Now you tell me if that kid's going to pay attention to his dad. So it doesn't take long. They're, you know, look how we're rearing kids today. We bring up kids that feel like they're the son of the universe. What a disgusting thing. Well, one of the best lines in the book, Have a New Kid by Friday, is this. An unhappy child is a healthy child. <laughs> There's times your son or daughter has to be unhappy. Okay? But I'm telling you, behavioral change, you know, those of you who want to lose weight, I can help you lose weight. You want to lose weight? How many of you want to lose weight? All right, here's what you do. Tomorrow, at work, in the break room, or on your office door, print your name and your weight and the date. <laughs> and then change it every Monday. I'm guaranteeing you'll lose weight. And the interesting thing is you'll all lose weight differently, won't you? But what's the difference? You're making the commitment. You're taking that first step. And that's the, the first step to behavioral change is taking that first step, right? So I'm telling you, this isn't rocket science. I'm not smart enough to, to do this in any complicated way. But I'm telling you, it can happen. So I'm going to do this on Monday through Friday. I got through two days in our first session. So we'll try. On Monday, just decide what you want to change. Focus in on one thing, whatever that is, okay? Every morning I get up. I'm 69 years old, which means I'm near death. Write that down. <laughs> but every morning I have the same conversation with God. God, I want to finish strong. I want to finish strong. Help me to finish strong. Uh, my litmus test is, can I go into a middle school and speak to middle schoolers? And can you hear a pin drop when I'm talking? And if you can, Lord, I'll continue to do what you ask me to do. When that day comes that the middle schoolers won't listen to this old man, I'm done. That's my litmus test. I want to make a difference. Don't you want to make a difference in life? Think about the people. I said last night, those of you who were here last night, you know, how many people are counting on you guys staying married? A lot of people are counting on you making this thing go. I'm telling you, women, women are weird. They, they, they speak a language that most men don't, are, they're clueless to. Uh, they're like hunting dogs. Uh, they come to a full point, you know, oh, when they're shopping. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mrs. Uppington and I are having dinner one night, okay? And... Uh, it's a Friday night, and all of a sudden, she comes to a full point at dinner. Oh, she says, it's Friday. Tomorrow's Saturday. I said, yes, honey, tomorrow's Saturday. It goes Friday, and then say, oh, honey, listen, oh, oh, why did I do this? Why did I volunteer this? Oh, tell me never to do this ever again. Oh, honey, listen. Now, here's her problem. She's got to get up tomorrow morning early, Saturday morning early, because she's volunteered to decorate for the church, for the woman's whatever they're having, Okay. But she's got two of our friends coming for dinner that night, Saturday night. So she's got a problem because Mrs. Uppington, my bride, store-bought cookies or desserts are Satan's sweets. <laughs> okay? Everything must be made from scratch. She's the firstborn. You know, everything's got to be just so. So she doesn't have time to pull off this wonderful dinner. She's a great cook. She's Martha Stewart incarnate. But she doesn't have time to make dessert. So now back to the full point. Oh, leave me, leave me, leave me. Oh, honey, listen. Oh, you got to give me. Oh, tomorrow morning when you get up, I need you. Now, listen to me. This is very important. I need you to go to Marie Callender's Pie Shop. And I want you to get one pumpkin pie and one lemon meringue pie. That's one pumpkin pie <laughs> and one lemon meringue pie. Now, let me point out to you that she's speaking to me like I'm a four-year-old. I went to college 13 years. I think I can retain <laughs> one pumpkin and one lemon meringue overnight. But with God is my judge, I don't make these things up. I get up the next morning, come out, and she's gone. Twice in 45 years of marriage, that woman was up before me. She's up before me, and, and she's gone. And there's a three by five card propped up, looking like a little teepee, you know. And it says, Dear Leamy, I, I, I miss you already, and I love you. Now, let me point out that that is a barefaced lie. <laughs> and she says, don't forget the pies. 
So I get up. I love college football, as many of you people do. And out west where I live, they start at 9 o'clock in the morning. It, the month is October. So I get up and say, hey, I'm going to get those stupid pies. Get that out of the way. So I go to Marie Kellner's Pie Shop, walk in. Big sign greets me, October special. Pumpkin pie regularly, $10.99, $4.99. What do you do? Two pumpkin. <laughs> One lemon meringue. So I get the three pies, bring them home. I'm sitting there by myself watching football. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have myself a piece of pumpkin pie. <laughs> so I go out, cut myself a piece of pie. And uh, by the way, ladies, no plate, no fork. In la mano como este. <laughs> and I just wolf that puppy down. And then I said to myself, that's stupid. You, 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 you should really savor a piece of pumpkin pie. So I went out, cut myself another piece of pumpkin pie. <laughs> this one I put whipped cream on. I put it on a paper plate and a fork, and I brought it in, and I sat, and I savored it. I savored it. And then I made the tragic mistake of going out, bringing the whole pie in with just a little kitchen knife. <laughs> Did you ever do the little sliver thing on a piece of pie? <laughs> Slivers are interesting because they... Uh, they dilute you into the, you know, this land of fairy. It's just a little sliver. Pop, boom, 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 boom. Well, four little whoops, and th there's one measly piece of pie left. I'm the only one home. <laughs> Mrs. Uppington is going to be home in an hour and a half. What do you do? You eat the evidence. <laughs> I ate the whole pie. I took the, the tinfoil thing and, and put it in the garbage compactor, shred the receipt, uh, covered my, my, sh my tracks as best I could. I'm telling you, a a a an hour and a half later, I hear her coming through the door, all right, on schedule. And I hear her in the kitchen, oh, honey, thank you for getting me the pies. You're so sweet. And she's tinkering around out there. She's making a fresh pot of coffee is what she's doing. And she hangs her pretty little face around the corner. And again, you've got to appreciate this. I'm sitting there like a bullfrog on the side of a pond. <laughs> I mean, I can hardly move. I feel like I got lead in my stomach. And she says, honey, would you like just a little piece of pumpkin pie <laughs> and a cup of coffee? Now, listen to what I say. Uh, uh, no, honey, I'm trying to be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my imperfection. What's yours? <laughs> and I'm telling you, as we talk about behavioral change in life, you have to understand how really imperfect you are and how dependent you are upon Almighty God for his grace because we're dumb as mud. And I, I love to think about the disciples, and I can't think of people who are dumber than some of them. They didn't get it. Now, these are the people who walked and talked with Jesus. They saw him perform miracles before their very eyes. How many of you ever had the thought how cool it would have been to be born in a time when you could be in the multitude, and you could be with Jesus when he took a couple of fish and some loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 people? Or the book of John over in uh, John 2, his first miracle at Canaan in Galilee. That was an interesting scene, if there ever was one. They're at a wedding feast, and they run out of vino. They run out of wine. Jesus' mother's there. She says to Jesus, hey, son, come here. Do your thing. <laughs> what does Jesus say to his mother? He says, woman? He says, no. He says, woman, what did you want to do with me? He separates himself from his mother and turns away from her. Now, what does she say to Jesus? What did you say? <laughs> you ungrateful little snot. Do you realize I gave birth to you at age 15, nine hours of labor? No, that's not what she said. You talk about a smart Jewish mother. She turned to the servant. She said, do whatever my son tells you to do. Whoa. She put the tennis ball life in Jesus' court. Jesus, I mean, it's one of the mysteries in the Bible, really, because it clearly says, he says no, and then you read on, he changes the water into wine. Well, what happened? I figured out a long time ago, I think what happened is Jesus' mother gave Jesus the look. <laughs> the same look you might give to your son or daughter if you asked him to do something. But it's interesting, because when the guy tasted the wine, he said, you're different from most. And that's my point, that God gave us his very best. He gave us the perfect one. So those of us who struggle with measuring up, you firstborn children, you know who you are, okay? I don't want to see hands on this, but your typical firstborn child, reliable, conscientious, list maker, loves books, they're the structured one. There are dentists, our uh, accountants, engineers, astronauts of the first 23 in outer space, 21 firstborns, two onlys. 
Not a middle child or a baby in sight. And yet your youngest son just said, Daddy, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> this would be a real good time to take little Fletcher down to Denny's and show him what the fry cook does. Because <laughs> he's not going to be in space, statistically. <laughs> he might act like he's in space. But what I want you to see is that firstborn who seems to have their life together, that Judge Judy, you know, got all the rules, knows exactly how to do things in life, okay? That little firstborn can become a procrastinator, start a lot of projects, don't finish them. That's their, their byline in life. You look at their desk at work or home, they have piles. They live in piles. You know who you are. You live in piles. But have you ever connected the dots that you live in piles because you had a critical-eyed father or a critical-eyed mother who could spot a flaw at 50 paces? Or maybe you have a kid who does the homework but doesn't hand it in out of fear that he'll be what? Criticized. They go through life like this. It's like looking for the drop-off in a summer lake in the summertime. You, know. you see what I'm saying? So if you're a critical-eyed parent, chances are you're not going to be that stereotypical firstborn. You're going to be the procrastinator. You're your worst enemy. You might as well take your shoe off and wear yourself in the teeth. And some of the things you do, you're great at setting yourself up for failure. God didn't create you to be a failure. But see, what an awesome responsibility we have as parents to encourage our kids rather than praise them. Praise belongs to God. You should see me on the Today Show or Good Morning America. Our guest today says that praise is destructive with children. Even the cameraman looks at you and goes, what's wrong with this dude? Everybody knows praise is good. Praise is not good for kids. Encouragement's good for kids. There's a difference in those two concepts. Okay? Praise God, all others pay cash. That'll help you remember that, okay? And so if you have that critical eyed parent in your background, how easy is it for you to, to understand that God loves you? So you always have to jump a little higher. You never get to that point of satisfaction. And that's how some of us are. So if you want behavioral change in life, you'll start a lot of things, and you'll, you'll, bat, you'll, you'll lose the same 10 pounds over and over and over again. I mean, you've lost 300 pounds in your lifetime, okay? Because you only go so far, and when you're hot, you're hot, but then you run short, and then you're right back to the earlier in behavior. And that's what happens to us. So that's, that's the product of uh, the critical eye. Now, you learn the lies about yourself in your family. I'm the guy that wrote the birth order book. Original title of the birth order book, when it was bound in rubber bands and, you know, manuscript form, had as a working title, Abel Had It Coming. <laughs> the publisher said, you can't have a title like that. Abel Had It Coming. I said, it's got a nice family flavor to it. I like it. <laughs> and they said, well, you can't have it. I'm the baby of the family. So I had a little hissy fit. I said, fine, then you name it. So they sat around their oak table, all a bunch of firstborn and only born children, by the way, I've had 16 editors in my life, and 15 of them have been firstborn or only born children. Okay? But they came up with a provocative title, The Birth Order Book. <laughs> anyway, I can't complain. It sold over a million copies, which means something. But you know, in your family, you, you, you know, think of your family, either the family you grew up in or the family you're the parent of today. Give the adjective to describe the firstborn. Now describe the secondborn. Now the baby, the family. Okay? Do you see? Here these cubs come out of the same den. Look how different they are. Then some of you might have identical twins, or some of you might... Is there identical twins here represented, either as parent or children? Any identical twins with us? None? Oh, over there. Oh, there they are. Identical twins are interesting. They're the same... They're genetically the same person. They're the same DNA. When I found this out, it freaked me out. Why did Almighty God give identical twins different fingerprints? To help the FBI? <laughs> or was this God's way of saying, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are what? You are different than everybody else. The scripture says God knows the number of hairs in our head. It says he knows when the sparrow falls. That's the God we just sang praises to this morning. The creator of the universe, 23 and a half degrees. One degree this way, we fry. One degree the other way, we freeze to death. We're, we're suspended right now in space. How awesome is your God? Is he big enough to help you with your marriage? Is he big enough to help you with your problems at work? He's God. 
Here's the problem. Oh, Lord, I'm yours, all 94%. Just let me have this dominion over this 6%. I wrote a book that comes out in, a, in February, which has already been selected as the key book for some book clubs. And that's a huge thing when you're an author. It means it guarantees mega, mega success for your book. And, the public, and I told the publisher, I said, I got a funny feeling about this book. I wrote it in 57 days from beginning to end. As the publisher said, Lehman, this book must have been in your heart. Chapter one, Jesus ain't the big bad wolf. He doesn't huff and puff and blow your door down. It's got to come from inside. My, one of my favorite chapters, attention, Walmart shoppers. Jesus has left the building. And I talk about cheap Christians. You heard what the pastor said next Sunday. You're blessed people. Fill those buckets. You know what I'm saying? And, and so uh, my, the other chapter that I think will, if nothing else, amuse you is this one. Oh, Lord, you're the potter. I'm the clay. But I do have a few suggestions. <laughs> and see, that's the battle. Because God has given some of us abilities. And we can get up and do it. And we say, Lord, let me, let, me, I, 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 let me drive a little while. I like driving. It's easy to get behind, you know. And, and God will let you. He'll, he'll move right off the throne of your life. You know, you just do your own thing. And what happens to you is you go through a highway of life. You crash. And what's the first word out of your mouth when you crash? Lord, that you, Lehman? Yeah. You just call me a little tow truck, get me out of here. It's on its way, fat boy. <laughs> he is able and just to what? Forgive us of our sin. I'm just saying, how can we learn that over and over and over again? As a kid in church, and I hated church, i got to tell you that. My, my mother, God bless her, we didn't even have a car, we were poor. And she used to have to hitchhike with someone in the community to take us to church. She had three kids, she took us all to church. And I hated church. And I remember, I remember the songs, though, it's interesting. Trust and obey, because there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus is the what? Trust and obey. There's a wall hanging. In my, in, my, in my bedroom as a little kid that I hated. I was embarrassed to have it around. It said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I just gave it to you, didn't I? There's a lady who prayed for me every day of my life. And yet, it was that woman that I met in the restroom that was the trigger that ten, turned my whole life around. Would you like to go to church with me, she said. Four months after we started dating, I remember thinking, oh, no, she's one of them. Because if there's one thing I didn't want to be as a Christian, I remember going to her church and saying, no chick is worth this. And then she wanted me to go back at night. Why would you go back at night? You've already been there in the morning. And yet it was at a Sunday night service that my world changed instantly. So how long does it take for behavioral change to happen in someone's life? I'm telling you, your, change, your life can change this morning with the right commitment and petition to God. God, I'm, I'm sick of playing these games. I'm yours. You know that one thing you've done in your life you've never told anybody about? That one little deep secret in your life? That's what's keeping you from perfect peace with your maker. Am I suggesting you come down here and flaunt yourself in front of everybody and tell everybody what you did? No. But I'm telling you, you have to confess that to Almighty God. And the problem with sin, folks, is this. It's a little bit like pizza on a Saturday night. You have pizza, four hours later, you can still taste the pizza. But God looks at you and me, and he sees us, as the old song says, as white as snow. And for one second, someday, if you know who Jesus Christ is in a personal way, you're going to pass into glory land and be with him because of the fact that he got on that cross. Did he want to get on that cross, by the way? No, he didn't want to get on that cross. He knew it was coming. Let me take you to John 14. There's an interesting verse, if there ever was one. I'm telling you, the disciples were dumb as mud. They didn't get it. They were with him when he fed the 5,000. They saw him perform miracles. Jesus took some mud, rubs it in this blind dude's eyes, and all of a sudden he sees. This is the God we worship this morning in the flesh of Jesus Christ. You say, wow, if I, if I saw that, I, I'd be on fire for the Lord. You know, I'd be unshakable. I'd be unstoppable. You fool. You'd be on fire for a while. And then guess what you do? You go right back to your carnal ways. Don't ever think the carnal self is far from you. When you drive, it usually pops out. 
I love these people. All these people got a Christian fish all over their cars, you know, big fish, little fish, truth, eat star, and all that kind of stuff. I wish they could drive like Christians. I'm telling you, they drive me nuts. But we love the signs of Christianity, okay? And all I'm saying is that you got to understand. I mean, I take, I take strength of knowing how stupid these guys were. John 14, Jesus gets up. He says, okay, listen, everybody, listen up. Peter, put your fork down. Eyes up here. This is important. Listen, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, and you know where, you, and you know where I'm going. I love this scripture because it brings out the stupidity of these people called the disciples, okay? And, and uh, Thomas is up first. He's dumb as a rock. And he gets up. He says, Lord, uh, oh, we don't know the way. And, and then I love Philip. He's even dumber. He says, yeah, yeah, show us the Father, and then we'll know. What does Jesus say to Philip? Philip, after all this time you've seen me, you don't know who I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Back to these liners of life, as I like to call them, you learn. I only count life when I'm perfect. I only count life when I control. Only control, only count life when I'm a victim or a martyr. There's a lot of people who get mileage out of that. Oh, Marge, I don't know how you do it. With Harold being out of work and the children, oh, I don't know how you do it. That little martyr, you know that person? She gets a lot of jollies from the martyr position. Or the manipulator, okay? The baby, the family, the attention getter, you know? I only count in life when I get other people's attention. I'm a college football fan. My license plate says Zap ASU, Arizona State University. The only good sun devil is a dead sun devil. <laughs> you know, for me, it's worth 50 bucks a year to look in the rearview mirror and see some guy go, <laughs> I know where that came from. I had a sister who was perfect, okay, little Miss Goody Two Shoes, a pastor. She's a pastor, associate pastor, children's ministry, never got to be in her life. Puts newspaper under the cuckoo clock. <laughs> I've never seen her furniture covered with sheets. That's what I grew up with. A perfect sister, perfect brother, quarterback in the football team, voted best looking in his class and all that. Then there was me. See, I've shrunk myself. I, I know why I could have a new you by Friday. That's a lot of bad graphical. It's terrible. Because I believe the lie that the successful people in the Lehman family was sister and brother. And both of them were very successful in life. Okay? Then there was me. But see, God always uses people. It was an old math teacher who pulled me aside senior year in high school and said, Lehman, did you ever think you could use those skills for something positive? That was the first time a teacher ever said to me, I had skills. But I look at the people in my life, my mother who prayed for me every day of my life, this high school teacher by the name of Eleanor Wilson, and my wife, the key women in my life that helped set up the situation where I said to God, God, I'm yours. He changed my life. I mean, I'm a guy that didn't get through consumer's math as a senior in high school. I remember looking at my daughter's math homework, math homework, and I said, Shazam, <laughs> when they start using letters. <laughs> I never got to that point. And yet, I'm here to tell you, God has used me in a mighty way to help people understand some simple truths of life, that you can be married. These women, I'm telling you, they're, they're just really weird. They, <laughs> they, they speak a language that we don't understand, and, and they ask questions. And, but when your wife asks you a question, she's really not asking a question, okay? Do you want to stop for ice cream? She's not asking a question. Or how about this one? Honey, we need to talk. I love that one. No words are needed by you, sir. Trust me. <laughs> but you can make it in marriage. You can make it in parent. You tell me what you want to be. What keeps you from being what you want to be? Claim your faith. Boldly claim your faith. Lord, with your help, I'm going to do this. I talked with a young lady down here in the front who said, you know, we talked last time you were here, and I'm out doing what, what, what I said I was going to do, and I thank you for your help. I want to be an encourager. I want to help people. Who's holding you back? Some of you, you don't need any enemies. Your enemies are inside because you're so self-critical and everything has to be just so. Go out in faith and do it. Make a difference in someone's life. Okay? 
Wow, I'm at, oh my, I've got 35 seconds left. Here's the problem. I have six points that if you don't hear, your life is going to be a failure. <laughs> but we're going to show our trust in God right now as I close this in prayer. Lord, we thank you for that. Th th this is your day. For those of us in ministry, it's a busy one, even an exhausting one. But Father, we know who you are, and we know that you love us. And we know you have a plan for each of us and that we're all different. So Lord, I just pray right now that you will intercede by way of your Holy Spirit for that troubled person who says, you know, I just can't make it. They need vitamin E right now from you, encouragement that they can. Lord, the scripture says if we want to be close to you, we need to move toward you. So I pray that right now, that there are people right now saying, you know what, Lehman, you're right. There's some things I have to do different in my life. So, Lord, I just pray in the name of your son, Jesus, who was and is and yet to come. Amen.